From Gravit, Arkansas, this is Shepherd's Chapel with Pastor Arnold Murray. Join with us now as Pastor Murray takes you on a book by book, chapter by chapter, line by line, study in God's Word. Now, here's Pastor Murray. All right, good day to you. God bless you. Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Hey, welcome to this family Bible study hour. We're going to get into a new study today, as you see there on your screen, War and Armor. It's a subject we did many, many, many years ago, and the old soundtrack kind of played out on it. So we're going to redo it, calling it the same thing, War and Armor. What kind of war are we going to be fighting here in these end times? And that's the war I'm talking about, the war that Christ puts together a Christian army to do battle. It's the same war, basically, that has been since the beginning. The controversy is between God and Satan. And Satan must, there's one thing he must do, he must abide by God's battle plan. And our Father tells us exactly how it's going to, going to come to pass. Therefore, it's pretty simple to prepare yourself for it. But you must realize that if we were to be caught short in any way whatsoever, it's that we're human and Satan is supernatural. The only way that we have even a breath of a chance with him is with the help of Christ through the Holy Spirit and then there's no contest. We have the victory. How do you gain that strength? Through faith. So it's not a time to be playing church because if you don't have the real thing, that is to say the real faith, the real truth, the real knowledge, then you're going to be caught short because, again, he is supernatural. He would deceive you. So we can always go by Paul where he speaks of the armor, and we'll take it first. He tells us exactly what armor we need. He tells us who our enemy is and um, how we put it on and what we should do even as we're wearing it. So let's go with it, if we may. You remember the book of Ephesians, though. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4 stipulates that some of you some of you were chosen before the foundations of this earth. That means even at Satan's overthrow and justified. And you will continue on down from verse 4 through verse 9 and find that you're called to God's purpose, not Satan's, not your own, but God's purpose, or it could even be translated God's plan. You've got to do it by God's numbers. And God gave us the victory as long as we are in Him. Always remember the great book of Matthew, chapter 18, verse 10, whereby, I'm sorry, chapter 10, verse, starting about verse 18, where we, are, we have total control over all of our enemies as long as we do it in Christ's name, of course. So, there's really not that much of a battle to it. But the trouble is, in these frail human bodies, oftentimes we let our guard down. And when you let your armor slip, you can be wounded very easily. And quite frankly, if everyone's honest with themselves, you get wounded quite often because we fall short. And Satan knows those that will fight him. And if he can catch you off guard, um, he's going to deal you a blow, whether it be in your family, home, your personal life, whatever, be that as it may. So with that thought in mind, let's begin with the gospel armor in Ephesians chapter 6, that great armor chapter. And let's pick it up with verse 12, if we may. I'm sorry, verse 10. And Paul being very frank within this, listen to his words, Ephesians chapter 6, and verse 10, and it reads, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. That's where your strength comes from. He tells you where to find it. Where? In the Lord. 
and in the power of His might. That's where your power comes from, from God's might. God's in control of everything. Therefore, you must heed His advice. Verse 11, put on the whole armor of God, not part of it, not a piece here and a piece there, but all of it. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles. What, what are these wiles? The deceit of the devil. Who is your enemy? The devil is your enemy. And it is his wiles or his deceit, his tricks. And if you don't have the whole armor on, he's going to get through to you, friend. He does it over and over and over. And as we mature, we learn, learn, learn to keep your guard up and keep your armor on and in place. What is it then? He tells us who our enemy is, the, the enemy, of course, and the reason we have the armor on is because of the devil, Satan. Verse 12, listen carefully. He's going to tell you what type battle we fight. For we wrestle not, or we fight not, we war not against flesh and blood. It's not an army out here in existence today somewhere, not flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. Well, who's that same one, the devil? The darkness of this world against spiritual, not physical, but spiritual wickedness in high places. Do you know what these high places are in the Greek? The heavenly places, where Satan is even in chains at this time, helped by Michael, Revelation chapter 12, verse 7, Help there, whereby um, that uh, he cannot come to the earth except in his spirit. That is to say, as some would call demons, the evil spirit is, is what the manuscripts call it. His evil spirit can still cruise the earth and catch you off guard wherever you might go. Now, don't look over the information in that verse. It's very important to you. Number one, we're not warring against flesh and blood. That's the reason anytime you take your, um, your frustrations out on a human being, you're probably in error. It's probably not the human being's fault. It's still the devil's fault that he uses that individual. Always be smarter than the devil. There is a conspiracy a plan by Satan to overcome the plan of God. He will always strive to do that. And God calls and chooses people to put on this gospel armor that become, as we discovered a couple of weeks ago in Jeremiah, that we're his hammer. He will use you as a rod. And that's why it's important that you absorb the method of battle, who your enemy is, what kind of weapons you need to defeat him, how to be a winner, because we are going to win. And God, which is from where your power flows, through his servants, in this case Paul, warns us and tells us exactly how it's going to be. The rulers of the darkness of this world. You know, the main conflict that you would have in the generation of the fig tree, which is the final generation, we find that God in His Word tells us exactly what will be transpiring and what method He will use in the 8th chapter of Daniel. I'm going to turn there real quickly. The 8th chapter of Daniel, and we see how that this spurious one, the false one, comes into being here on earth when Michael boots him out. He gives us his method of operation, his M.O. And it's important that you familiarize yourself with his M.O. So that when that M.O. comes into your life or you are confronted with it, you know what to do about it. Okay. We have here in the 8th chapter, 
of the book of Daniel. I'm going to turn over to verse 23, and it reads, And in the latter time of their kingdom, this is, this is Satan's um, wicked kingdom, when the transgressors are come to the full, a king of furious countenance and understanding dark sentences shall stand up. That's your dark sayings from high places like, like uh, demonics from heaven, false plans, um, pretending to be something they're not. How does he operate? What are you warring against? Listen to it, verse 24. And his power shall be mighty. So don't, don't expect it to be a pushover. It won't be. His power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. And he shall destroy wonderfully, not ferociously, but wonderfully, and shall prosper and practice and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. That is to say, he'll deceive them. Why? Because he claims to be God. He claims to be Christ. Uh, bear in mind, Emmanuel means what? And this is what God said to call Christ. Emmanuel means God with us. Verse 25, listen to this M.O. when the false spurious one appears on this earth. And through his policy, his what? His policy. What's that? His M.O. Also, he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand. That's deceit, performing miracles. And he shall magnify himself in his heart. That's always been Satan's number one problem is his, his pride within himself, Ezekiel 28, the reason God sentenced him to death. Now, how does he do this? And by peace shall destroy many. He shall also stand up against the prince of princes. That's to say Christ himself. But he shall be broken without hand. In other words, our father's in control and his understanding dark sentences will not help him because you're supposed to be armed and equipped, not against combat out here in an open field with tanks or heavy equipment or atomic weapons. Wouldn't help you one iota. You've got to be equipped to handle those, that spiritual conflict, to combat, if you would even, the deception, the lies. How does he conquer? Peace. Then when they cry, peace, 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 and there is no peace, you'd better be careful, and that's a cry you hear a great deal today as we come into line with the new world order. You better get your suit on and see how it fits, friend. I'm talking about your armor. You'd better be accustomed to it for the time of its having need to be used is, will happen within this generation, meaning you, the more you are practiced, studied, and equipped, the more knowledge you have concerning your enemy. Part of winning a battle is knowing your enemy and knowing his weak spots. He already knows yours, I can promise you that. Look how many times he's caused you to fall for it because of your weakness. That weakness that always gets you in trouble causes you to fall, to slip. He knows it. Okay, we're coming to the place where Christ was betrayed by Judas. And Christ's ministry was finished in the in the flesh, that is to say, and it was almost time for the crucifixion. Now, I want to go to the 22nd chapter of Luke as we work our way back to that sixth chapter of Ephesians. What does it say? Listen to this. Then Jesus, this is to say when they uh, accosted him, when Judas betrayed him, then Jesus said unto the chief priest, this is the religious community, and captains of the temple, and the elders which were come to him. Now, who is he talking to? The religious community, the chief priest, captains of the temple, and the elders. Those are your high muckety ducks. And 
remember what he had said in Matthew 23 that the scribes and Pharisees, meaning the Kenites, not all Pharisees or Kenites, but certainly at this time they had taken over and our brother Judah pays the, the price because most people don't know the difference between our brother Judah and a Kenite. All right? Anyway, Christ states then, but uh, the elders which were come to him, be ye come out as a thief with swords and staves, this ragtag army that they brought with them when Judas betrayed him. It wasn't the Roman army. Verse 53, when I was daily with you in the temple, I was down there every day teaching practically. You stretched forth no hand against me, but this is your hour. I underline it, your hour. Who is he speaking to? The religious community, that is to say, one that would pretend to be of God, but is of Satan. This is your hour and the power of darkness. And there you have that same darkness that you must be well equipped for. How the gospel armor will not help you dispel the darkness. It takes light to dispel darkness, and light is truth, and Christ is that light. Christ is that word. Christ is that truth that gives you the MO, the plan, where the battle's going to take place, what you're supposed to do about it, and why you have the armor on for your protection. I repeat, for your protection in the first place. Simple wisdom. Why would, why would Jesus say, your hour? Because he's talking about that hour of temptation that is mentioned in Mark 13, Matthew 24, especially mentioned in Revelation chapter 3, where you escape the hour of temptation by knowing those who claim to be of our brother Judah but do lie and are the synagogue of Satan. And he especially in Revelation 17 gives you the total picture of that hour of darkness. That, that hour that you might say is the frosting on the cake of Satan's plan. The hour when his governmental body comes into full being, written in Revelation 17. And of course that hour is a five month period. We'll, we'll talk more of that as we come along. That's the hour you can escape the temptation, and I guarantee you it's not some flutter by like a moth caught in a flame and fall in a tailspin. You're supposed to have the gospel armor on and in place to do battle for the Lord spiritually. There's only one way that you can combat the wisdom of Satan, and that is to have the wisdom of God in your forehead, meaning in your mind. Having the seal of God in your mind, there's no way that Satan can put his mark on you. So it's important that you understand the dark sayings because they are lies, deceit, one-worldism, socialism, and you hear a great deal about socialism in this great free nation, not put here by war, but put here by peace in general elections, by socialistic peoples. And most people don't even recognize it. The whole gospel armor, my friend, and the dark methods that Satan uses to overcome and to deceive the world. All right, let's get back now to the sixth chapter of Ephesians. We had uh, covered the 12th verse concerning what we're fighting against, not a flesh army, but we're fighting against a spiritual enemy, Satan, a supernatural entity working with false peace and false hopes and deception on our people. Verse 13 of that chapter 6, great book of Ephesians. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, not just a piece here and there, all of it, that you may be able, that you can do what? That you will be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all, I repeat, all to stand. 
You have no trouble with it. That's God's promise. If you'll put it all on, if you will analyze it, if you will understand it, you won't have any problems dealing with deception that Satan in his operation will bring upon this world that in fact already is through the evil spirits and the forces within man that wants to be so important. Verse 14, stand therefore, don't run, don't fly. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness. Now, let's take each of one of these, as, if we may. What is your girt? Well, your girt is your belt, basically. And when you were told in the Old Testament days to girt yourself up, men wore skirts, all right? I'll call them skirts, long apparel, not trousers as we do today. And you would reach between your legs and grab the back hem of the back of the garment, which was down around your legs, and pull it up and tuck it in your belt where your legs were free to do battle. That's what you girt yourself with to do battle is God's word, God's truth. That's your belt that holds you together. That's what you girt your loins with is truth. And what is truth? God's word. It gives you strength, power, and authority. Without it, you're nothing, friend. When you talk about a battle we're talking about here, you, you wouldn't last as long as a snowball would on a hot July day. You would be gone, finished, complete. But with the truth holding you, you have no problem. You will stand, and I guarantee you Satan will go around you. He's afraid of you. When you have the truth, then know his weaknesses. His main, uh, the main arrow that penetrates the heart of Satan is light about his dark sentences. It just cuts to the very heart. Many times when you mention socialism in this world, it just cuts the little liberals right. It's just an arrow that cuts them right to the core. Why? They know deep down they're wrong. Socialism leads to communism, and world over, communism has toppled, put people in hell, on earth, starvation, uh, f the world falling around them, and then you would have some idiot that would try to bring socialism into this nation today. Like it or lump it, that's the way it is, all right? That's truth, and you're supposed to girt yourself with it. All right, now, what about this breastplate? What is your breastplate? That's the metal thing that protects the most sensitive, vital part of your body, your heart. That breastplate is made up of righteousness. It's the same thing that your righteous robes are made of in, that you will wear in the millennium and in the, in, in the third earth age. Those robes are made of your, that material speaking in a spiritual sense, is woven from your righteous acts. How many yards of material do you think you put together, friend? How many righteous acts do you have? If you don't have any, you're going to be naked as a jaybird. That's written in the book of Revelation. The material and its method of being made is recorded in the 19th chapter of Revelation. But make sure your, your righteous acts or deeds protects the vital part of life for you, your heart. You got it? You gird yourself with truth and you breastplate that to protect you is righteousness. That's believing that he is Lord. We're not talking about the weakness of the flesh here, but the strength of the mind that has been called and means well. That's what's important in this case, not some little old silly sin you might do on the side, which is, that is to say, aside from your working for God. Don't do it, yes, of course, but being righteous and serving God. Verse 15, and your, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Now, what does that mean? What does that mean, your feet shod 
with the preparation. What is preparation? When, when, when someone prepares a meal, what do they do? They prepare for it first. You can't just sit down and start eating. Well, it's the same way with the preparation of the gospel of peace. You have to prepare for it. It takes preparation. It takes preparation and time and patience to absorb knowledge plus prayer to the Father to retain it, to release it to you and then for retention of it, thereof. So, you see, preparation of the gospel of peace, meaning, what is gospel? What does it mean? God's spell or the good news. Good news that we're safe. Good news that we're, we're secure in Him. The good news that we have power over Him. He's afraid of us. You don't have to be afraid of Him. He's afraid of us. And some of you are champions for God. You better start acting like it. That's not a thing of pride. It's a well-armed soldier for God. Do you understand? We're learning this armor one piece at a time. In other words, the preparation. Your feet are what you, you have, you have about 206 major bones in these human bodies, the skeletal thing, and you have muscles that drive it, and what happens to be fastened on way down here at the bottom are feet. And it uses those to travel the flesh body, the, to make that skeletal frame mobile whereby it walks, it travels. So you use that preparation to travel with the gospel of peace the world over. And God has indeed blessed us, uh, this ministry, I mean, with, with the vehicle and the platform that certainly we have prepared those shoes, our feet, for traveling in the split second, traveling to a whole hemisphere and, uh, and, and around the world in ether waves, uh, whereby that gospel of peace can go forth, whereby people can arm themselves and prepare themselves mentally to be champions of God. That's what preparation having your feet shod with that, being ready to march, all right, ready for action. You're never, as an old military man, I can tell you, you're never ready for action unless you're well-trained and highly motivated, knowing your enemy, knowing where to hit him, and how to have the victory, all right? That's what we're doing, is preparing ourselves whereby we know and we take forth this peace, that peace being as forestated. You don't have to worry. We've got that victory. Okay, verse 16, above all. Whoo, there's a powerful statement. In other words, this is most important. Above all, taking the shield of faith, What's a shield? Well, that's, that's what you hold out here to drive off the darts of Satan, those fiery little old darts. He has a way of firing at you. Your faith in what? Your faith in our Father and His Son. Without faith, you can't be healed. Without faith, the Holy Spirit won't touch you. Without faith, um, you needn't even ask God for anything. He's not going to give it to you, especially this armor. So above all, foremost, the most important thing, take the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all, not part, all the fiery darts of the wicked one. And then there may be someone that would say, well, what if one of them gets through? What if one of those little darts get through? You see, my advice to you would be to stop right there. Because above all, you didn't have faith. Because if he tells you not one, if he says all, he means all. Not one will fall through. Not one will slip through. But you will have a shield that will protect you from the deception of Satan in this end generation. There's no way he can deceive you. As a matter of fact, you learn to stand against him 
And as God hated Esau, you learned to hate Satan and his actions on your people, the way he deceives them. Above all, taking your faith, your belief, and putting it to work, practicing it to know that your Father knows what you need before you even say it. If you need protection, he knows. Verse 17, and take the helmet of salvation, Yahshua, the name of Jesus, Yahweh's Savior. He is our salvation. That is your helmet. That's what you put on your head. And the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. What is that sword? As it is written, as it is written in Revelation chapter 1, verse 16, Christ's tongue is a two-edged sword. What comes from Christ's tongue? It forms the very Word of God that comes forth sharp as a two-edged sword, meaning it cuts both ways. And Satan's lies are ground to powder. How can you use or be armed with a sword if you don't know the Word of God? Let me put it a different way. You don't have a sword. You don't have a weapon if you don't have the Word of God. Arm yourself with it. It's the best time you can ever spend in this earth age, in your little old flesh body, is to arm your mind with the helmet of salvation, Yeshua, Yahweh's Savior, the Son of God, as your helmet, the living word, and arm your mind with that word. And not only that, what he's saying to you is be able to speak it if you're called upon. You don't have to be a professional teacher or speaker. The Holy Spirit will aid you. Know it whereby you can repeat it. The Holy Spirit at one time, as we will find out how this battle, armor, and the war, what is required of you, how that you'll have no problem if you have that faith. Verse 18, praying always. Doing what? I'm going to tell you something. You can put on this armor, and if you don't do what we're about to be told here, you're not going to make it. This is very important. With your armor on and in place, there's another part. This is it. Praying always with all prayer and supplication. Supplication means if you need something, ask for it in the Spirit. If you need uh, something to further God's work, ask for it. He'll give you the bricks. You build it. And I'm not speaking about buildings only. Think about that. And watching thereunto, in other words, be alert. You're a watchman. That's what a watchman does with all perseverance. Do you know what perseverance is? That means uh, to stick to something. Don't be a quitter. Persevere. Make good. Don't quit and you'll always overcome. You may have to take a detour, but you'll get there. Persevere and supplication for all saints. Uh, so, perseverance in prayer to your Father. Let Him know. Study His Word. Keep yourself well armed. And you'll always be prepared to be a champion for the living God. Our Father is so very proud of those that serve Him. He is so very proud of His champions. There's not that much competition in this generation with most people being biblically illiterate. They don't have a sword. They may have a scalpel that may even have a handle coming out of the end of it, really look like a man of God. But when he pulls that little sucker out, there ain't nothing to it because he doesn't have the Word. The Word is a sword that penetrates. 
and not too many people today seemingly can stand it. They would rather be too busy enjoying the hour of darkness. See that you don't, beloved. Be a child that God can take pride in, that he can be happy with. I know that you say, well, you want me to be perfect? I'm not talking about perfection. We'll never be perfect in the flesh body. Get off of the guilt trips of, that are put on by a lot of Christians that all they know is don't do this and don't do that. I'm talking about the war against Satan in this end time and knowing his M.O. and how to defeat him. That's what I'm talking about. God knows our problems and our little troubles, and they're not good. But he knows that some of you have a heart that can war against that that is wrong and that that offends our people. You have compassion for them. That's love. And you want to do something about it. Then study your Father's Word, and that's why I love you so much. You enjoy doing that. All right, bless your hearts. You listen a moment, won't you please? The book of Ephesians. Ephesians, one of the most beautiful writings in that it tells you in chapter 1, verse 4, when God's elect were chosen and what the purpose was for their having been chosen before the foundations of this earth age. Have you ever felt you had a destiny? It's very possible that you will find it in this book of Ephesians. Say, what are you supposed to wear? This is that book that tells you what the Christian wears. In the sixth chapter, you find that beautiful gospel armor. The purpose for each piece of that gospel armor, what you put it on for, and quite frankly, it's to stand against the fiery darts of Satan. Satan giving you a rough time lately? The book of Ephesians will help you to sort out and control Satan. All right, bless your hearts, there we are back again. Hey, let's have a look down there at that old 800 number, 1-800-643-4645. Uh, that number good from Puerto Rico throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, and all over the North Country, Canada. If the spirit moves and you have a question, hey, let's have it. We can no longer answer all of them, but we'll reach in, we'll take a handful, who knows, the one that comes up. You that listen by shortwave around the world at this time, it's so good to have you with us. And again, very soon now, we're going to be in over 100 million homes in Europe by television. So keep that little old short wave warmed up, but we'll, we'll keep you advised. And, and um, if it be God's will, and it would appear it is, we'll be looking at you there very soon. Now, if you've got a prayer request, then all you have to do is talk to him. He's your father. Father, we come to you at this time, and we ask that you lead, guide, direct, touch, heal, in Yeshua Jesus' precious name, amen. Okay, well, it would look like that, that uh, Jackie, age seven, is going to be the first question coming up. And Jackie is from, I don't, I don't have, but she's got a little picture even for me here. And I'll give you a big hi right back there, dear. When did you become a Christian and when did you become a preacher? And kids at school laugh at me because I believe in God and Jesus. Love you, Jackie. Uh, all right. Well, hon, don't you worry about the kids and their little chuckles because you will be the champion that God uses. He loves you so much for making that stand. I became a Christian many, many years ago when I was not too much older than you are, about the same age, as a matter of fact, I would say. And I became a teacher preacher about 41 or two years ago. And I've enjoyed every minute of it. It's real good that you enjoy, that you do believe, and that you do study, and that you love our Father's Word. You know, Jackie, there's a lot of adults that would say a seven-year-old girl like yourself 
could not understand the way Pastor Murray teaches. I'm glad that I have you and many more like you that give witness contrary to that. Thank you, dear. I love you a bunch. Okay, Pat from California, Romans 8.15. Please explain the spirit of adoption. Well, the spirit of adoption, when Christ died on the cross, he opened salvation to all peoples. Therefore, before this, Gentiles were not a part of the nation Israel. But in accepting Christ, they are adopted into the kingdom, if you prefer saying it that way. And uh, that's what the spirit, of, the spirit of adoption is, the Holy Spirit. Okay, Roger, from because anyone that believes on him, even a Kenite, if they love the Lord our fa and our Father and call upon him and accept Yeshua, then they are no longer Kenites, but sons of God. Do you understand? They're adopted, even they. Roger from North Carolina. The scriptures say all men have sinned because of Adam sinning first and, and passed it to all his offspring. Since he is the eighth day creation, are you saying his sin is retroactive back to the six day man creation? Um, well, no, not really. Satan was on the earth as uh, chapter 3, verse 1 declares. And, and it states that he was more subtle, that's trickier, slippier, than any living being on the earth, uh, even including the creatures. And that means Gentiles also. By that I mean the Gentiles were here. They were the six-day creation. And uh, don't worry, Satan has a way of being supernatural, and we all have a way. I don't care what race you are. In the flesh, um, uh, there's sin there. So they didn't need Adams. Adams was from Ha'adam, uh, through whom Christ would come, that eighth-day creation. But uh, be that as it may, um, everyone sins on their own. I assure you Satan had already taken advantage, okay? Jeff from Florida. Who was Nun's father and grandfather? And I see that you, you're a Levite, okay? Well, Nun, uh, his genealogy is located in 1 Chronicles chapter 7, I believe it's verse 27. Now, if you're, if you're using a King James Version, it will be spelt N-O-N instead of N-U-N, but in the Hebrew, it's still the same word. Just because the vowel is different, then it's the same man, all right? And it'll give you his father and his grandfather. I, I believe that's right. Uh, if you have a strong Concordance, check it out with the spelling N-O-N, none and um, rather than N-U-N, and you'll have his chronology. Same man, okay? And I, I believe, if my memory doesn't fail me, it's First Chronicles chapter 7, along about verse 27. Marilyn from California, are the Nephilim still with us today? Do they die? No, they are not with us. They are in chains, and Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 through 6 and 8 will tell you when they are cast out. They're cast out when Satan is. Their spirits are here, and they don't die. They're in chains for a final destruction. We'll probably be talking in the next lecture uh, as we complete War and Armor, uh, how, when they die even, okay? Cindy from Texas. Do the ten leaders emerge before or after Antichrist is here? They emerge before. Remember? Revelation 13, verses 1 through 3, how that they rise from the people. That's to say this, the water is symbolic of the people. Revelation 17, documentation. And they uh, almost come to power, but it receives a deadly wound. So they, they, but the one world system will not become de facto until after Antichrist appears and heals the political system. 
Cora from North Carolina. Please document where you can receive healing by anointing and laying on of hands, not the mockery of it. Well, in the first place, I could not document where I could lay on hands and heal anyone because I can't heal anyone nor can anyone else. But if you do it the way God instructs you, then he will heal them by your laying on hands and anointing them. James chapter 5, James chapter 5 will document it for you. If you want to make a deeper study, I have a tape titled Anointing. There's some other subject with it, and it won't come through to my memory right now. I guess I'm getting old. Let's see. Anointing and apostasy and anointing. Yeah, are all on one, all right? So, be that as it may. John from California. In 1 Thessalonians, is this speaking of after the Antichrist has returned? 1 Thessalonians covers a lot of subjects. Uh, there are, are uh, five uh, chapters in 1 Thessalonians. Uh, what, what, you know, it speaks of many things. Primarily, I'll answer it in this way. Primarily, both 1 and 2 Thessalonians address the second advent. That's to say the returning of the true Lord. And it naturally, the Antichrist does return before the appearance of the true Lord. He comes first, as is documented in Mark chapter 13. Marty from the Bahamas, what happens to all of the flesh bodies at the change? Good question. Let's see, how will I answer that? Um, there we must realize that with the change of stepping from the flesh, there is a, it is a change into a spiritual, now, now really think for me, a word to the wise is sufficient, a spiritual dimension, changed into a spiritual dimension in which the flesh does not exist. It's not in that dimension. However, it is a very poor translation, but in Ezekiel chapter, I'm sorry, Zechariah chapter 14, you have a very good description of, of how it will be, only it's a very frightening description if you don't understand that certain things just simply evaporate, melt like wax, you might say. Uh, I, I, against perhaps my better judgment, I mentioned that particular chapter because it frightens a lot of people when we start talking about eyes melting in their holes and this sort of thing, all right? But read it, it'll help you. It's a different dimension. In other words, let me ask this question. Christ, after the transformation, that's to say into his new body after his resurrection from the tomb, he walked through a wall in the room in which the disciples were sitting. Now, my question would be this. Which did that mean in as much as he walked through the wall? Did it mean the wall wasn't there in his dimension or Christ wasn't there in the wall's dimension? All right? I do that to help you think. Sher Sherry from Florida. Uh, thank you for the blessing. What, why did the elect who did not bow to Satan have to come through this earth age to teach perhaps? You've got it. Hey, they're special people. They're God's elect. They came here to do battle against Satan. That's why they came here. And God knows that they defeated Satan before. They're the ones that assisted him in the overthrow as if he needed any help. And we're going to do it again. Looking forward to it, ready to go. All right? Jane from California. In my heart, I feel like I'm not good enough, and I feel like I need to do more. What? Question. Well, well Jane, welcome to the club. There's not one living being that feels good enough to be close to God. Why? In the flesh, we all fall short. We do. So... Paul himself would say, I always want, I, I start out with my plans and I always want to do it exactly 
right, but it seems like ultimately I end up doing exactly what I didn't want to. Paul himself made that statement. Don't ever remember the preciousness of repentance. And when you know you've fallen short, repent. Don't cry about it. Get up and start plowing. Get on about your business. None of us are good enough. If all of us waited until we were good enough ourselves to take communion, there would not be one communion service in this world. Only Christ could have taken communion. But if you believe He was good enough, then take it. Because I assure you, He was. If all of us waited until we were good enough to be baptized, we would no, not a living soul would be baptized. That isn't what you're baptized for when you're good enough. You are baptized as a witness that you know and believe and have faith that Christ died, went into the tomb. But He came out and He stood up. Uh, and that is your witness publicly that you believe that. Nobody's good enough, my dear. Don't worry about it. Do what? Well, this gospel armor uh, lecture we're doing now will help you understand what you're supposed to do. Guy from, don't know where Guy's from. We, we does the Bible, I'm going to say that should be where. Where does the Bible say that flesh cannot enter the kingdom of heaven? 1 Corinthians chapter 15, I believe it's verse 50, all right? And um, we, you might as well say, well, I'll just answer why also, because it cannot go into that dimension, or it cannot, it, it's sin, it's perishable, it doesn't last that long, all right? So we shed it. Mona from Texas, is the, uh, uh, let, me, let me follow that by saying, when God parts the silver thread, not anyone else. Mona from Texas. Is the Antichrist going to arrive in the sky? He will arrive and imitating exactly what Christ stated it would look like when he returned, If no doubt, all right? Not necessarily, but I'm sure that he will. He is coming from heaven, and he's pretending to be Jesus, come to fly everybody away. And boy, is the world waiting for him. They're ready. They're going to believe him. All right, many will. Robert from, uh, from Connecticut. Why did Jesus tell disciples in Matthew 10 not to go to the Gentiles, but to only go to the lost sheep? Well, uh, in the book of Matthew, he told the disciples only to go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel because he had not paid the price on the cross yet and opened salvation up to all peoples. He gave an example of that when he walked 50 miles one way and 50 miles back to talk to one Gentile woman, the woman of Tyre, and offering her salvation. That was the, in part the indication that it would be opened that way. Okay, Jackie from Pennsylvania. Are the black people descended from Cush? If not, where did they originate? On the sixth day. Cush came through Ha'adam. That means the Adam who was created on the eighth day. Uh, I know that it is commonly taught Eve is the mother of all living. I know that it even states that in Genesis, but it means be because Christ would come through Ha'adam's helpmate. And Ha'adam, the Adam is what I'm saying, which means the man, that individual one. And... Um, uh, Christ created all the other races. Of, well, that's a, that's a correct statement. The Spirit moved and created all the other races, the Holy Spirit, on the sixth day. And God looked, if you will read the last verse of that sixth chapter, I'm sorry, the first chapter of Genesis, and it says, it, he, God looked and it was good. He was so proud of each of the races. Don't ever anybody apologize for their race to me or I'll get on your case real bad. And I'm not talking to Jackie. I know she wouldn't. Okay, Cecilia from Arkansas. In Samuel 2, chapter 1, verse 18, the book of Jasher is quoted. I happen to own a copy. 
Uh, the word jasher, what does it mean in the Hebrew tongue? It means the upright one. Moses was the upright one, and the book we're talking about is the Pentateuch. Okay, uh, Vera from Tennessee. I trust you don't think it's stupid. We teach this body of ours, I'm sorry, we teach this body of ours goes back to and to another earth, but the soul goes to heaven to visit, to wait the judgment, true. That being true, what comes out of the grave when the Lord returns to take his uh, born again Christians? He doesn't come back and get them. All that's in that grave is the remains of the flesh. He doesn't come back and get them born again because they're already with him. All right, and you need to listen again to the to the 